Hey, 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 welcome everyone. I see people are already commenting in here. It is crazy. People are so excited to hear from Suzanne. Um, so welcome. If you guys uh, don't know who I am, there are a lot of new people who joined this group today because Suzanne is in here for this workshop. So uh, I am Becca and I run this Facebook group called the Happy Ever Crafters. And uh, I've recently started doing a series where I'm interviewing other artists about their craft and also about their businesses. And it seems to be a pretty big hit so far. So I'm really excited for today's. Um, we are going to be talking to Suzanne Cunningham. And I have her live in here with me. Um, she's just not on the screen yet because I need to do a couple housekeeping things first. So um, if you're tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from. We always want to know that kind of thing. That's always super fun to see. So um, just comment in the comments below where you're tuning in from. I won't be able to see your name, but I'll be able to see your comment. So um, let us know. But um, yeah, as soon as we get started here with Suzanne, I'm going to stop posting or stop looking at any of the comments in the chat. We're going to be really just talking about a lot of the questions that were submitted ahead of time. And uh, we'll be kind of working from that and just having a little chat. And then Suzanne is going to do a live demonstration on flourishing, which is, I think, why most of you are here. Um, so, yeah, we won't be answering questions that are coming in live. We're going to open it up at the end if we have time to a couple questions. So keep them for the end and just stay tuned for that. And, um, and hopefully that will kind of make things move a little quicker. We have a lot of stuff to cover today and there's a lot to learn. Um, and then the other thing is I had people asking if they should have their supplies ready to do this um, demonstration with Suzanne. And we discussed it and we think it's better if you just watch and learn from this video. And then there's going to be a replay available always so you guys will be able to go back and actually use your tools and follow kind of the advice that Suzanne is giving you. So for, day, for today, just, just watch and learn. Um, and then you can watch it again later. Um, there are also going to be some free flourishing worksheets that Suzanne has provided. So uh, at the end of the video, I'll let you know exactly where you can go to get those. And um, yeah, I think other than that, I'm just trying to look at where people are tuning in from. Wow, we have Hungary. That's crazy. We've got California, Ohio, Dublin, Ireland, the Netherlands, Ontario. Yay. Um, Okay, so yeah, lots of lots of awesome places people are tuning in from. And I think we should just jump right in because there's a lot to go through. So without further ado, let's welcome Suzanne. I just got her up on the screen here. Hello. And Hello. Oh. There's my dog in the background. <laughs> they think someone's at your door. <laughs> I don't know. There's no telling. She'll go out in a minute. Oh. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for coming on here. Really excited to Thank hear. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The queen of flourishing. So people oh, are all excited about hear. that. It'll be fun though. We'll have fun. Yeah. So um, I guess the best place to start is just if, if people don't know you, can you just tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, a little bit of your background? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, I have been doing calligraphy or actually probably what I thought was calligraphy for about 25 years. Um, and today is my wedding anniversary. So happy 24 years to my husband. Um, I started calligraphy about a year before we got married. And, um, but just as a child, I would always try to sit and copy different kinds of letters. Uh, my mom had a speedball book of alphabets and I would sit and just try to copy all the beautiful letters out of that. And this was just with a regular pen. And if it, you know, had a shade, I would draw in the shade and fill it in and things of that nature. And um, write down just anything I heard. If a commercial came on TV, I would write down the slogan of the commercial. So I've just always been writing as long as I can ever remember. And then in 93... Uh, my boyfriend at the time, my husband now, told me to make a few samples and take them to some wedding shops. And so I did. And we lived in Birmingham, Alabama at the time. And there was a lady there uh, at a store called Weddings, etc. I don't think it's there anymore. But she was very kind to me and put me in her book of her calligraphers. And I think she probably felt a little sorry for me, but she kind of pushed me a little bit, you know, told her brides that... I was good or whatever. And I charged a whopping 50 cents an envelope at the time. 
So now I, I can't even imagine. And I still remember the day that I went up to a dollar an envelope. I just could not believe. I kept telling my husband, I said, there's no way I can charge a whole dollar. It's a dollar. It's a dollar for an envelope. <laughs> People are not going to to spend that much money. So anyway, but that's kind of how I got started. And I had, I, I was always completely scared of the pointed pen, just terrified of it. I don't really know why, but I, I could not operate it. I could not make it work. And, um, I was on Instagram. I was following a few calligraphers at the time and someone made a comment about prepping the nib. And I, it seems like I commented back and said, what are you talking about prepping the nib? I don't even know what you're talking about. And so they explained to me that a new nib, you know, has a clear coating so it won't rust over time and you have to get that off or, or the ink is not going to stick on the nib. So anyway, when I learned that that fact existed and I cleaned my nib and I got the ink to actually stick onto the nib. That was a glorious day. Like I could hear the hallelujah angels just singing above me. So, and I thought, yeah. Can I just interrupt you for a second before yeah. you said you, so before you learned this, you were, yes. you were using a pointed pen. You were just like struggling through it or before that. No, yeah. it. Oh, I wish I had a copy. I wish I had, um, Hold on. Oh, I do. I do. Hold on one second. Okay, hold on. I'm going to put this down on my paper and see if you can see this. This is the pen that I was using. Can you see this? Nope, not quite. There we go. A little bit. Yeah, if you move it down a little My computer more. is on delay, and so I can't see yet what I'm doing. Um, anyway, this is a Pilot Precise V7. And um, this is what I would use. And it's really just a rollerball pen that I would get at Office Depot. But what I would do is I had a, um, a leather binder that I would sit in my lap on my sofa, not at a table or anything. It, this is prehistoric. And um, I would put my envelope on the leather binder. And when I would press down with this pen, it was just... It had enough cushion that I could get just a little bit of a swell. And then when I let up, I would get just a little bit of a hairline. It was not much at all. But it was just enough that I thought it was okay. And it, it, that's what kept me away from the pointed pen. Because the this Pilot Precise looked good enough that I thought, well, th this is still pretty. And it was pretty. It was fine. But, um, you know, nowhere near what you can get with a pointed pen. So, anyway, for so years many, on end, I used this stinking rollerball pen. <laughs> so, how many years ago was it that you actually started, like, purposefully using a pointed pen and practicing that way? Um, it was about four or five years ago. That's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. To me, I thought, oh, she must, she's been using a pointed pen for 25 years. It's crazy. So, for, like, 19 or 20 years, I used the, the, <laughs> the rollerball pen. Yeah. And cranked out envelope after envelope. And I will have to say I could go a lot faster than what I could do, you know, with the pointed pen. I could do about 18 envelopes an hour um, and still have them to look, you know, really nice and have good quality to them. So Which is like it's a testament to to the fact that the materials don't make the artist. Right. Like, it, I think that's so interesting because people really yeah. have trouble. I, I guess so. And I remember not too long ago, I wish I had this in front of me. I, um, I was babysitting for a friend of mine and I actually wrote her invitation and I saw it, she had it framed and I saw it there. And this was one that I wrote with my, my little cheapo pen. And, um, I remember thinking that I really, I still really loved the way it looked. It looked still really fairly nice. And so I was really happy with that because I think a lot of times we look back at our work and, you know, we think, how did I even write that and think that it was okay? So I was really kind of relieved that I still thought that this looked pretty okay. I think that's so cool. And like, I'm, I'm shocked. I really would have thought you've been doing point and pen for 20 years. <laughs> well, I, I think I was a little bit ahead of the game once I did figure out how to manipulate the tines and work with the pen. I knew the letter forms pretty much already. And I was doing a lot of things already correctly that I just wasn't aware that I was doing correctly. Um, so I feel like I was ahead of the game once I started. 
So that's so anyway. cool. Anyway. So now, like, what does your day to day look like as a professional calligrapher? Well, right now, um, this is my busiest wedding season. Um, I, I've done when, when January hits, I think everybody gets engaged over the holidays and then it just hits, you know, fast and furious for these spring and summer weddings. So I've been doing envelope after envelope, um, pretty much since January. Um, and I go very slowly. I only book myself off for about 25 envelopes a day. So I'm usually sitting at my kitchen table. I don't even have an office with the desk. I'm literally at my kitchen table in my eating area. And uh, which is nice. I like it. I'm in a bay window and I have all of the light coming in. So I'm completely fine with that. But um, I sit and do envelopes pretty much on and off all day. I would probably get way more than 25 done a day if I could just sit for hours on end and write. But um, I can. I go change the laundry or I have to run to the grocery store or, you know, the phone rings. Life just gets in the way. And then before you know it, I have to go pick up my daughter from school so, um, by the time I go to bed at night, it has taken me all day long to get those 25 done. And it seems like it shouldn't, but it just does because I can do about maybe eight or so an hour, sometimes 10 if I really get in the groove and the, the addresses aren't too, too long. But, um, I don't know. It takes me all day long to get those 25 done. And if I have some free time, I'll do more and kind of get caught up a little bit. And I don't book off any over the weekend. So I only work Monday through Friday. So if, if I'm ever behind, like if I have to go to the doctor one day or, you know, just something happens and I can't do any envelopes one day, then I have the weekend to catch up. So usually by the time Monday rolls around, I'm, I'm pretty much caught up and um, can uh, not sink too far underneath the pile of envelopes. But <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's usually my typical day. It's usually envelopes, some, not always, use, usually so. Um, sometimes I'm working on another, you know, kind of project, whether it's a baby cross or a set of vowels or something like that, but usually envelopes. So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's really interesting to me because I always wonder what, like, I, I know envelopes are a huge thing, but I never knew if it was like, you got, you know, vows or other things like that that were as constant as the envelopes. Yeah. It, the envelopes are the the main source of the thing that I do. And they, they are very time consuming. And um, I think people are happy to pay someone else to address their envelopes because it is a very tedious job, especially if you're not used to it and you don't have your little system down pat. Like, you know, I've got my ink in a certain spot and I've got my outer envelopes in a certain spot and my inner envelopes right next to it. You know, my list stays in it's a certain place. So I've got my system down just like I like it. And so it's not tedious as much, I guess, for me, because I know what I'm doing. But um, I do think that's why people don't mind paying someone else to do it, because it's such a huge task for them to take on, especially if they're trying to plan their wedding right in the middle of all that, too. Yeah. So I think works. also, like, when as a calligrapher, the first time you do that and you don't charge somebody accordingly is when you realize how much work it really is yes. and yes. how much you really need to be charging and why you're charging them. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> because it's not anything that you can rush through. And it, it, I mean, you have to take your time because it has to look good. If you rush through it, then it's not going to look good. And that defeats the whole purpose of them paying you in the first place. You know, they want a beautiful envelope that they can keep forever if they want to. Um, and so it's got to look good. So you have to go slow. You have to take your time. And I write very slowly. I follow, you, just like you do, I'm sure, a ton of calligraphers on Instagram. And I see them writing so much faster than what I write. But I just feel like quality always wins out. And I can make it look so much better if I go slowly. So that works for me personally. If if I could write faster, I would love to. Um, but I just can't do it. I, I need to go slow and concentrate and make sure every single stroke. I like to think about, so if you're making the lowercase letter A, 
I try to think about when I make the letters um, and I get to that letter in a name, like if I'm writing the word James and I get to the letter A, I don't think of that as an A. I think of that as an underturn, an oval, and I mean a, an entry stroke, an oval, and an underturn. And I feel like when I separate it out and say those names as I come to them, um, then if I were to go and electronically pluck that stroke out of the whole name, it should look just like that stroke is supposed to look. Um, and I try to do that. It's kind of tricky, but I try to do that some in my workshops too. Like if you take um, the word James, for instance, and you pluck out that first overturn in the M, a lot of times that one will look great. But if you pluck out the second one just by itself or the third one just by itself, a lot of times the top will be pointed. It won't have a nice round arched top. And a lot of times it will be shooting two sideways out from the one before it. That's kind of hard to explain without writing it. Um, but I feel like if I say overturn, overturn V-shade in my head instead of an M. Um, it helps me to keep every single individual stroke looking as good as it can possibly look. I love it. I probably love slows it. Yeah. me down. I don't go as fast, but I, I just feel like it looks better in the end and that I'm, I'm happier with it in the end. So that works. I for love me. that because I, I, I had a workshop recently and I, I always tell people that you're trying not to think of it as a letter. You're trying to think of it as the separate pieces. Yes. And yes. we're getting off on a tangent here because we got to talk about I flirt. Know, I know. But, but I had a workshop recently and the girl said to me, um, I can't see the letter. I can only see the strokes. And I said, perfect. Yes. Perfect. Yes. That's what you want. That's what, yes. exactly what you want. That is okay. That is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. So I love that you're validating. Good for you. That. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so let's talk a little bit more about um, you being a professional calligrapher. So I asked you ahead of time, but I can't remember what you said. I am Pith. Is that how you say it? Yes. I am. Pith. So yes. what, what is that? And what does that mean for you? Like, how are you involved in that? So this year, I'm really excited for Iampeth. Um, I'm going to be at one of the teachers, and I'm going to teach a flourishing workshop. But Iampeth is just one of the international conventions that um, you can learn about calligraphy. If you don't already know about calligraphy, you can um, get better at it. If you already know great, you know, what you're doing, you have no problem with it. You're more advanced. Um it covers the whole gamut of beginner to advanced um, calligraphy. You don't um, necessarily have to have the skills yet uh, to be able to enjoy it, which is nice. The very first time that I went, I was absolutely petrified and scared to death and so intimidated. And I was so wrong and I was so happy to be so wrong. Everybody was so um, encouraging and, oh, it's so great to see you, Suzanne. I follow you on Instagram. Or even if they don't say that, you know, like, how are you? My name is so-and-so. It's so glad to, um, I'm so glad to have you in class. Just very welcoming and encouraging. And it, it put every one of my fears to rest. Absolutely. Um, so this summer, I'm going to be teaching a flourishing class at Iampeth. And um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I really do love flourishing. I feel like it is just a beautiful way to, to just enhance your letters and enhance the whole look of a piece that you're working on, whether it's an envelope or vowels or whatever it is, a quote, a Bible verse. It just really adds to the whole look of the piece. And you never want it to take away from the look of the piece. Um, you don't want it to look messy or jumbled up. And that's a couple of things we're going to talk about today. Um, you want it to be very, for me personally, I want it to be very structured. Um, I don't want it to be haphazard. I don't want it to look messy. And I don't want it to be so over the top that it takes away from your beautiful letter forms because that defeats the whole purpose too. And we got, we had a lot of people asking those exact questions. So I'm really excited for you to kind of show us what you mean on that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, okay. So if we're going to jump into kind of having you teach, but let's, let's cover a couple um, of the kind of precursors to that. So tools, 
Um, would you say that it's better to use a straight holder or an oblique holder? And what's your favorite nib was one of the most, most common questions. Yes. Yes. Um, so I have some of my favorite nibs sitting here and I can turn the camera down if it works out and, and, um, go over some of these. Hold on just a second. Let me get this straight here. Okay. Tell me if you can see these. Yes. Okay. So this is one of my favorite holders that I use. It's made by Lindsay Hook and she is phenomenal. I absolutely love her to death. I have three of her holders and um, this one is custom made to my hand, but she has a, a beautiful website that she sells her pins on as well. Um, so this is probably my go-to holder that I use. Um, let me look right here. Can you see this nib right here? Yep. Uh, this is a Nico G. I use it probably the most often. A lot of times people say that the Nico G is for beginners, and I completely agree with that. I do think it's a great beginner nib. I also like to use it for envelopes, though, because I feel like when you press down, the swell that you get, the shade that you get is not quite as wide as it's going to be with some of these other nibs, like a, the Gelat 303, you're going to get a wider shade. But when I get an envelope that has writing that's fairly tight on the envelope, like there's a lot of ink right there in a small space, I feel like for me personally, and this is just my opinion, but I feel like that a little bit of a lighter shade kind of looks a little bit better to me. I think it's a little more pleasing. There's not quite as much black, um, dark ink on the envelope. And the overall look, even though the hairlines are not going to be quite as fine with the Nico G as it will with the 303, I still feel like the overall look is a little bit lighter than it is if I use a nib that's going to have a heavier shade. So I do love the Nico G. I love the Zebra G. I love the Hunt 22. It's one of my very favorite nibs. Um, the 303 is a, a great nib. Now, this is going to be a little more pointed. It's going to catch just a little bit more in your paper, so you you have to concentrate on lightening your hand with this one. The 404, I have found, does great with metallic ink and handmade paper. That's that is, Jalot, Jalot 404? Yes, yes, exactly. Jalot 404. I, I always use either the Jalot 404 or, let me scoop this in another order. Or this one right here, which is a Blanzy 605. I use one of these two all the time with both metallic ink or handmade paper or both. Um, this is a vintage nib, so it's going to be a little bit harder to find. The 404, you can order straight off, you know, John Neal Books or Paper and Ink Arts. It's very easy to find and not expensive. Um, and then this last one is one that I, I have a few of these nibs. It's called a Valletta, and it is a vintage nib also. It makes a beautiful, a beautiful shade. How do I spell and that? V-E-L-L-E-D-A, Valletta. So those are just a few of my favorite nibs. And I also love the ones, and I'll get this one out right here, that have these little springs on the back of them. Can you see that? Yep. Um. And I ordered these, uh, I think I ordered these from John Neal. I know Paper and Ink Arts has them as well. But there are tons of different kinds of nibs that come with these little springs on the back. And that acts like an ink reservoir and it holds a ton of ink. Um, I really enjoy them. Not so much when I'm doing envelopes, but if I'm ever going to record a video and I don't, you know, you only have a minute. And so you have just a, a certain amount of time that you have to get all of your lettering done within. So a lot of times I'll use these caged nibs on my videos and I don't have to stop and redip for ink. The only thing that you need to worry about or not really worry about, but be cautious of with these is when you dip your nib into the ink and then you bring it over onto your paper, you need to do that a little, just be cautious at the speed that you do that with, because if you bring it over onto your paper too fast, there is a lot of ink within that little coil and it, it might drip out. That's the only thing that I 
you know, seem to have found maybe that I don't like. Um, but it's not that I don't like it. You just have to be a little bit more careful about how you move your pen in the air. Right. Um, because that little, that little blob of ink can come out. Um, cause there's a lot of ink in the nib, but that's the whole purpose of it. So. And so what about, uh, what about the holders? Um, okay. So let me move this out. The, most of my holders I don't have right in front of me because actually I use this one almost so all if, of the time. If you were to um, advise someone whether or not to use a straight or oblique holder, what would your advice be on that? I personally use um, an oblique holder. But now I know a lot of people who use a straight holder. I like the oblique. Can you see my hand? Yep. I like the oblique because your nib needs to be lined up with this slant line right here. And I feel like, I don't know if I naturally hold my pen, say if this was a straight holder, I naturally hold my pen like this. Well, this is not running in the right direction. This is running in this direction. And this is my slant line right here. So in order for me to get my nib on a straight holder to run in the right direction, I have to either crook my hand way over or I have to turn the paper way over to the side. And if I have the oblique holder, this uh, flange right here kind of shoots the, um, the nib over to the side for me. And then this way I can just hold my hand in a natural position, you know, what's comfortable to me. And I don't have to turn my paper quite so severely. I can just have it turned probably at about a 45 degree angle, which works just, you know, perfectly with me. So that's, that's why I enjoy the oblique holder. Um, it's, but it's now I have a lot of friends that like the straight one too. So you really do just need to kind of play around with it and see what works best for you. It, it is a very personal thing. I had, um, so I was at Paul Antonio's workshop. If anyone's not following Paul Antonio, you need to be following him. Um, I'll pop his name up on the screen here in a second, but I was at his copper plate workshop this weekend and he recommended using a straight holder. And so it shocked me because when he came over to adjust my posture, my, he turned my sheet pretty much completely upside down for the way yeah. that my hand needed to be. Yeah. And I've never written like that in my life. So it was, it was interesting, but I think it's, yeah, I love what you're saying about um, it being on the right angle and just whatever's comfortable for you. If it's more comfortable to get your hand on that angle with the oblique, then yeah. then by yeah. Honest, yeah. For, for whatever reason, and I'm, I'm sure it's operator error. I'm sure I'm doing something incorrectly. Um, but for whatever reason, when I use a straight holder for more than just a few minutes, um, the, the top of my hand starts aching. I, I don't know what it is. It's just it's not used to that angle. I don't know. I don't know. So the oblique for me is much more comfortable, but now, you know, that's just my personal opinion. That's what works for me. So that's what I do. So if you like the straight holder better, you do what works for you. It's both are totally correct. Cool. Okay. So we, we did nibs, we did holders. Um, I don't know if we'll be able to show this very accurately using the phone and how you have it positioned, but can you talk a little bit about how you are positioned in relation to the desk when you're writing? Yes, I, um, okay, let me see here. And I will be the first to say on, <laughs> on posture, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> um, I will inevitably cross my legs and I know that's a big no, no, Paul, do not call me out. Um, which he probably will, but that's okay. But I, I will always end up crossing my legs, but that's a no, no. You're supposed to keep both feet on the floor. I like to sit actually with my feet on a large book. I have a book underneath my feet right now. Um, it just, I don't know, it feels more comfortable, the angle. Um, it's almost like my knees are pointed a little too far down when my feet are on the floor. It feels a little more comfortable when it's a little higher. Uh, so I have a book up underneath me. Um, I sit about halfway out on the edge of my chair. I'm not like my back is not touching the back of my chair at all, but I'm not on the edge either. I'm just about halfway on the seat. Um, of course, you're supposed to sit with a straight back and tilt from the hips. You're supposed to have your shoulders down. And this is one thing that Paul would correct me on every time. I, I must write like this. I don't know, because he would always come by and press my shoulders down 
which would work for a little while. And then, you know, there they come back up again. So I do think it's very important to have correct posture. I believe that 100%. But I also know that I'm human. We're human. We're going to sit however it's comfortable, you know. And um, if my if my left shoulder comes up a little bit or my right shoulder comes up a little bit or I end up crossing my legs, you know what? I'm just OK with that. I, I'm completely fine with that because I know I'm probably going to do it anyway, even though I know I'm not supposed to. I just don't fight it. I, it's low in my totem pole. It should be higher on my totem pole. So please don't um, send me a nasty email saying posture doesn't matter. Posture does matter. Um but it, if I have sat too long with my legs crossed, I'll get up and walk around or I'll uncross them for a while and I'll be more aware of my posture at that moment. But um, it, I, I think it's very important, but I don't think it's everything. I think being comfortable is important, too. So I do think you need to sit however it's comfortable for you. Um, as far as my paper goes, I usually have this pointed. I will try to turn my phone around. I don't know if you can see that whole entire sheet of paper. Yep. Pretty much. Um, yep. That is about at a 45 degree angle. So my slant lines are right here and my slant lines are coming toward me. Now that is comfortable for me. Um, but I have a lot of people at my workshop that, you know, they might need to rotate their paper a little more severely, a little more sideways or maybe straight up and down a little bit more, but right at about 45 degrees where these slant lines are pointing right toward me, that works for me. That works for me personally. Um, and one thing that I just always try to do, I always try to write with this sheet of paper or, or my envelope or whatever it is I'm working on between my two shoulders. So if I'm getting out here and it's a little too far out, I just scoot my paper to the left and I keep whatever I'm working on right in front of me. And that's going to help keep your angle, uh, keep you at a proper angle. Because when you like when you're writing right here, can you see my hand? Yep. When you're writing right here, you know, the angle looks great. Everything is going along just fine. And then when you get all the way out here, can you see my hand now? Yep. The, your writing is going to look a little bit more straight up and down. You're not going to be able to see the angle quite as well as what you could see when it's right in front of you. So um, it's very easy. Just slide your paper right there to the left a little bit, and then your writing is right up underneath you again. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think that's something a lot of people don't recognize when they're writing. Yes, I think so too. I think so too. It's just like, I don't play tennis anymore, but when I used to play tennis um, and I would go to serve the ball, if I had a bad ball toss, I would hit it every time anyway. You can retoss the ball. <laughs> you can also move your paper and you don't have to write, you know, with it three feet away from you. You can slide your paper over to the left and keep it right up underneath you in that sweet spot. So everything is, is mobile. Yeah. Okay, and then the, the last question I kind of want to touch on just before we get to you actually showing us some beautiful calligraphy. Um, a lot of people struggle with using their arm and not and and not just planting their hand and using their hand. So what kind of what tips do you have for that? Like where is your arm positioned on the table relative to where your, your envelope is? Okay, um, let me grab an envelope here, and I'll show you one thing that I do too that helps me. Again, what I say may not work for you. So, you know, just take it with a grain of salt and play around with it and find what works for you. So, okay, can you see this envelope okay? Yep. Okay, so I have, let me find it here. And this is just a, a scrap sheet of paper. Um, this is uh, Borden and Riley cotton comp uh, marker paper. It's very thin and it's very slick, but I'm not saying this is what you have to have. Any kind of slick paper uh, will help. Um, so normally I don't have this paper up underneath here. Normally this is sitting on a light pad. And so this part right here is my light pad and which, you know, that's glass. And sometimes if your hand gets a little hot, let me grab my pen here. 
and I'm getting down to the zip code right here, my hand is resting on that glass and it sometimes it won't slide very well. So I just put this sheet of paper and I tuck it up underneath here. So now I've got a really slick surface for my hand to, to glide across. That helps me a lot. A lot of times, like if I'm making this four, for instance, that is all finger movement. I, I'm not, I'm not gliding my hand. I'm not moving anything from my shoulder. Really the only time that I use uh, arm movement is probably going to be with a larger flourish. And at that point, I don't even know that I would do it right here on this flourish, but let me come over here and can you see this? Yep. I tell you what, I am going to switch and put this in my holder. Yep. And because I think we're probably finished. Are we finished with the stuff that, that I need to be on the camera for? Yeah, yeah, for okay. sure. Okay. Okay. Give me just one second and let me put this in my holder. And you tell me if I get off the screen. Okay. Can you see that okay? Uh, nope. So you're off of it now. Nope. I'm off. You move your paper up a little bit. Okay. The paper needs to go up. Yes. Up and left a little, maybe. There we go. Yep. Okay. Is that better? Yep. That's perfect. Okay. Perfect. You tell me if I get off screen. Yep. Um, okay. So say that, hold on. I got to get my glasses on too. I'm 50 now. I can't see anything without my glasses. <laughs> okay. So say I am making this K for instance. Um, so I start with the base of the K. I start like maybe right here. And I do my stem of the K. I make my little angled stroke with my dot. I do my underturn right here. And now I'm ready to do this big giant flourish. So all of this movement right here is coming strictly from my fingers. But once I start and put my pin down right here, I lock my, my whole wrist in place. I'm not doing any finger movement anymore. My, my, my wrist is completely locked. And I come up here and I'm sliding my whole entire hand. And I'm sliding and I'm sliding and I'm sliding and I come around. And maybe when I get to right here, I may finish it off with some finger movement. But this whole entire portion right here I am sliding my whole hand and it's not really a ton of movement coming from my shoulder. Like, you know, it's not big and giant. It's still relatively small, but um, it, it's not going to be more than about that right there. You want this little fatty portion of your hand right here just to glide across your paper. And a lot of times if I'm making, let's see, let me find one of these flourishes. Can you see this okay? Yep. I do uh, this a lot. Oh, actually, let me do this one right here. Can you see this one? Yep. Okay. Like when I go to make this flourish, I lock my wrist into place and I just shoot my whole entire hand over to the left. See, my fingers are not moving at all. And then I pick up my pen and I put, when I get down to here, now I'm doing finger movement. Finger movement, finger movement. Now I've got to move my hand a little bit. As soon as my hand moves, as soon as I know that my fingers won't stretch any further and I've got to move my hand, my fingers stop moving and I lock it in place. And now I start to move my whole entire hand. Does that make sense? Yeah, totally. It makes sense in my head. So then when I start, say, back on the B again, I start right here. Now I'm doing finger movement because this is relatively small. This is still all finger movement, finger movement. And I get right about here. And I know that that's going to kind of cramp my hand a little bit. So when I get down to this point, I lock my fingers and I just drag my hand down. I make the little inner loop. I usually pick up right there and reset my hand. And then I come down and drag it down my whole hand, come up. I'm moving my whole hand now because that's a large flourish. And this is still my whole hand. So it really, I kind of really weave in and out of finger movement 
and whole arm movement. And again, when I say whole arm movement, it's not a huge movement. Uh, like it's nothing that like Mike Ward is going to do. He is the, the king of, of whole arm movement. His flourishes are so quick and, you know, large, and he does need his whole entire arm to do that. This is much slower, and I kind of just weave in and out of finger and arm. So this is going to be whole arm movement until I get to right here. That's going to be finger, 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 and then I stop and I do my whole arm right here. But then I come back to finger movement right here, and then I come up. And then from this point, I'm doing arm movement again. So when, when you say arm movement, like where, if, do you have, um, do you have your whole elbow and forearm on the table or are you kind of resting like halfway up your forearm? It, it's about halfway up my forearm. Okay. My elbow is, my elbow is completely off the table. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. And I'm just, I'm mainly sliding this little fatty portion right here on the, on the paper and then maybe to right here. That kind of slides as well. Okay. Um, gotcha. But um, yeah, it's, I, I definitely have at least half of my forearm on the, um, on the table. Okay. Yep. Good to know. All right. So I think, um, I think we've, we've covered some basics and we've talked about your career and stuff. I think we just need to get people some flourishing help. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So I'll let you, um, I'll, I'll kind of watch in the chat and I'll see if there's any questions coming up, but I'll try not to interrupt until, um, okay. until you're, you're kind of wrapping up and then okay. we'll, we'll take some questions at the end. Perfect. Perfect. And let me just tell you really quickly, um, before I get to the flourishing part, I wanted to show everyone, um, one of the guidelines that I made because I get this question all the time. So I thought I would just show this just really quickly. This is just made out of cold pressed watercolor paper. And I, like, I can do nothing on the computer. So I literally draw these out by hand every, every time. And I have a ton of these. I don't make one for every single envelope order, but I, I do a lot um, from the top right here to my first baseline is 12 millimeters. And then from baseline to baseline, to baseline, to baseline, that is going to be 14 millimeters. Now this particular one, my X height is four millimeters. A lot of times though in envelopes, I will write in three millimeters, which is what this one is. Um, but regardless if it's four millimeters or three millimeters, what I like to do is I will draw in pencil another extra little line. I don't want this to be as dark as my pen line. So that's why I do it in pencil. These are for my numbers. So I'll make my numbers this tall. Um, and this is about from my pencil line to the baseline is about six millimeters. And you that's something that's really through, set in stone. Do what now? Run us through those, those millimeter numbers again once so I, we can write them down. Yes. Yes. So let me just write it on here. Um, okay. From this top, very top line to the yeah. first baseline is 12 millimeters. This particular X height is four millimeters. And then, and I'll explain in one second why I do this. From baseline to baseline to baseline to, me, to baseline is 14 millimeters. And the reason that the reason that from here to here is 14 millimeters, but this top one from here to here is only 12, because when I go to write this second line, can you see me right here? Yep. When I go to write this second line, um, say the address is 123 Main Street, and I go to write this M, I just automatically know that I'm not going to go all the way up to the very top of this line. I'll leave a little space right there. But I don't draw in my top line on each one of these because when I get this top line drawn in, I did it one time, and then this space was so close in width to my X height, I was having trouble remembering which one my X height was. And so I just leave this line completely out. So there is an imaginary top line right here. And right here. 
And so I'm going to write, I'm going to do all of my capital letters right there. And I just know that I need to stop short of this baseline and leave myself a little bit of room right there. That way there's just not quite as many lines on my guidelines and it's a little less confusing. And again, that's something that just works for me. You know, that may not work for you. You may have something fabulous that you can print out on the computer that worked way better than this. Also, I do like to have a center line drawn. That kind of helps me know, um, like if I'm writing 123 Main Street, I might not know exactly where to put it on the envelope, but I do, it's easier to cut that in half and kind of center. Well, I know I need about this much on the left of my center line and about this much on the right of my center line. It just helps me to keep everything centered. So is that your only um, kind of means of centering things? Because we did have someone ask about um, whether or not there was a quote unquote hack on how to center things. Yes, I, I do think a lot of it is just kind of trial and error. Um, like I know that when, of course, I have to write the word Florence a lot because that's where I live. I know when I go to write Florence, I need to start my F right about there. And I know Alabama is going to end right about there. So that's going to be centered. I know when I write the, the word Birmingham, it's longer. So I need to start my B over about right there. And then my A in Alabama is going to end right there. But if I get up here and I've, I've started too far over to the left and I'm writing my A in Alabama and I know that this is really off center and that's not going to look good. All I do is just put a big giant flourish off the end of that. Which is where all of this new flourishing knowledge will go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so then all of a sudden my B is over here. And now my flourish has ended up over here. And that's probably at least one inch. So, you know, I can make that flourish as, as big as I need to or as small as I need to. If I didn't need one that came way out here, I might just simply come around and stop it right there. If I needed, say, a half of an inch. So you really do just kind of have to play around with it. And occasionally, not very often, but occasionally I will not start over to the left enough. And I'll get that line written and it will be way off center to the right. And at that point, I probably would come back over here and bring this loop maybe around like this and just put a little flourish on that side. And this can be any way that you want to do it. But I would just extend this somehow uh, to, to take up that room. That's probably a half an inch right there. And again, you can make that as big as you need to or as small as you need to. So there are a lot of little hacks, I guess. Um, with the flourishing, you can add to the left. You can add to the right. Um, a lot of times on my, on my top line, if I haven't started over to the left far enough, so it's off-centered and it's way over to the right. So my M... usually looks like this. This is my go-to M for envelopes. Um, usually what I'll do, and I have to turn my paper sideways for this. I don't have to, but I can make the shape prettier if I do. Um, I will take this and come around and out like this. And so now that has extended that M. So instead of taking up this much space, it takes up probably an inch and a half. So that, that definitely helps me center on the left on that top line. And I will do that fairly often if I see I've gotten off and it's shot way over to the right. So it really comes down to that center line helping you kind of do the basics of the centering and then practice and knowing how long your city names are and what you're yeah. calling. It, right it, <laughs> it really honestly is a lot of practice, but I, I just know that if I have Mr. and Mrs. first, middle, last name, I need to start my M probably right about here because Mr. and Mrs. is going to take up almost to that center line. I'll probably end the S 
and Mrs. right about there. And then I can do first, middle, last name. Um, I know that if it's only Mr. and Mrs. first and last name, name I can probably start my M right about there. It, it's just a lot of trial and error. But when you get it down pat and you kind of get in the groove, it doesn't take that long to figure out, oh, I started that way over to the left the last time. I know to come over a little bit further this time. And then there are always those states that you just know you've got to scoot way over to the left for, like Massachusetts is going to take up a long, uh, a, a lot of room on your envelope. So start, however far you start over to the left, start over a little bit more because it's probably not <clears throat> going to be long enough. If your address line has southeast, northwest, anything like that in it, always start way over to the left. I feel like it's easier to flourish off the right end than it is to flourish off the left end. So if I'm going to make an error, I want my line to be off-centered to the left a little bit because I feel like it's easier to add that flourish on the right end, for me personally anyway. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so, Okay, so um, I think you had some worksheets you wanted to yes. walk through. And then, um, yeah. Yes. Okay. So let's <clears throat> get to the fun stuff. So hold on. Where did my paper go? So just looking at, let's look at this for just one second and go over some of these flourishing rules. <clears throat> Ascenders and descenders are obvious places to begin your flourishing. Um, just like we extended this K way on up and made a huge flourish out of that. Um, exit flourishes and, uh, or exit strokes and entrance strokes are another good way to uh, do your flourishing. That's one of my first go-to places. Here's one coming off of the entrance. And the way that I did this T, I started it right here. I did my, my capital stem, put a little flourish on the bottom, and then I started right here and came down and around for my H. And then I came back up to right here, and I did this little loop and came around like this. So even though this is a very elaborate entrance flourish, uh, I, I didn't start right here even though this is all hairlines and it, and it may kind of look like I started right here, I actually started it right here. So that's another little hack that you can also remember that it, you don't have to start in the obvious place. Um, also, the crossbar of the T is a definite, you know, go-to flourishing place. Flourish is also, and I, I feel like people probably already know some of these things. Flourishes look better if, they are crossed at 90 degrees. It's just going to be a little bit more appealing to the eye like this right here. So if you can cross at 90 degrees as much as possible, you don't want your flourish to have a very squished, severe X shape. You want it to be, <clears throat> excuse me, nice and open. So no to that one, yes to that one. And, um, it's also completely fine to plan out an elaborate for flourish in pencil first. Let me show you. This is what I did. Can you see this? <clears throat> this is what I did in pencil first. So, and you can see all of my lines that I've had to erase and uh, go back and redo right here on the B. This took me a little bit to get the shape exactly like I wanted it. You know, if I wrote this just in pen right off the get-go, it probably would look fine. But I knew I could make it look better if I did it in pencil first. I don't always do everything in pencil first. But if, if it's going to have this many flourishes to it, I probably do if I can do it in pencil first. Um. So that is completely fine. Don't be, <clears throat> don't uh, think that you have to do it in pencil right from the get-go. Okay, so let's go over to, let me erase this real quickly. Let's go over to our examples 
And these are a couple of the sheets that you all will get um, as a free download. And if anyone takes my takes my flourishing workshops in the future, these uh, I'm redoing these right now. So I'm really proud. <clears throat> excuse me. I'm, I'm really proud of how the new ones are turning out. Um, they're they're sort of similar to these, but just updated and a, a better version of these. Um, so I thought what we would do, and Becca, you just tell me if we have enough time and, and stop me when you need to stop me. I thought I would take each version and just simply kind of walk you through it and tell you what to look for and exactly how I kind of critique myself and the things that I, I strive to do <clears throat> in these flourishes. Okay. Can you see my hand? Yep. Okay. Just tell me if I ever get off. All righty. And this is something that you can do with any underturn. Uh, it doesn't have to be on an A. We're just doing an A just for examples. So, and keep in mind too, it's hard to talk and do this at the same time. So these may not be my most beautiful flourishes ever. So on this underturn, if I don't have a lot of room, I'll simply take this up and over. Suzanne, are you able to move your camera a little closer to the letter? Yeah, let's see here. Is that better? Yeah, that's better for sure. Okay, can you yeah. see it? Okay. <clears throat> okay, just tell me if I get off screen. If you could actually, like, can you just do one little tap on your phone screen? Because I think it will um, focus a little better. And... Okay, it's hard to tell from here if it's focused. Let's see. Yeah, I think that's better. If someone in the chat, uh, if someone in the chat could mention whether or not they can see that properly, just because it's hard to tell from the program we're using. But yeah, just just go ahead and carry on. Okay. And, okay. It, and it may be sometimes when I scoot it that close to the paper. Um, sometimes it's a little harder for it to focus. I'm looking on my computer now and I'm not so sure that that looks completely focused to me. Oh, okay. It's a, yeah, people are saying it's not focused, so maybe I'll have to okay. back up. Okay. Let me back it out just a little bit. Tell me if that's better, uh, clear to you guys. I think it's better. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's just go with that. All right. So. One of the things that I want to look for is I want this spacing to be even all the way around here. So on our most simple version of our flourish, that's pretty much all that I'm looking for. Okay, so moving on to our next version. I do this a couple of different ways. So I have a nice oval that's implied right here that sits right horizontally with the baseline. I like this because this is my first descender line. This is my baseline. And this space is pretty much even right here on the bottom and the top. So your first descender space has kind of bisected that. And this sits completely horizontally. So I like the shape of that. And then sometimes I also will do this this way. Okay, I think this one works because this implied oval is not running horizontally like this one was, but it is running along your slant line. See, there's my slant line right there, and this is running parallel to it, and here's my oval right here. And I also like the shape of this because this is parallel all throughout here. 
and this line coming right here kind of cuts through the middle of these two spaces. So I like the shape of that. All right, and then adding on to this, Okay, so on this one, we have this little inside loop right here is an oval, right? And we want this to run completely parallel to our slant line. And I like this because this space around the inner loop is parallel all the way around it. So this inside loop is not like way off to one side where you have a lot of space on the left and then a, not a lot of space on the right. It's kind of tucked evenly between this little U shape right here. So I like that. And I do like the fact that uh, this implied oval right here runs along your slant line. And that's not completely necessary by any means. And sometimes I, I miss the mark. Absolutely. That this just kind of gives me something to strive for. And I feel like most of the time, even if I miss the mark a little bit, it still looks better when I try to make all of these things work than if I don't. Like if I try to make this oval run along my slant line. And if I try to make this inside loop tucked neatly in the center of this outside loop, even if I miss that a little bit, it still looks better than if I don't try to do those things. Suzanne, can you, um, can you move your paper up a little bit? Yes. Is that better? Um, even a little bit more. Just because I think the camera is focusing on the leather. So if we just get the paper in the in the plane of view instead of the leather, it might focus on your letters a bit better. Oh, okay. Okay. Is that better? Um, let me try and look here. I think it's still off a little tiny bit. If you can move it up and left a little. Yeah. And then maybe try um, and tap on your screen one more time. Sorry, I know this is a little uh, finicky, but it's um, tough to see. Okay, I think that's probably as good as it's gonna get. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, can, we can definitely still see what you're doing. It's okay. super cool still, yep. Okay, perfect. Okay, so moving on to the next flourish, and this is not necessarily the very next one in the examples that I'm giving, but I'm gonna skip a couple. So. I do this shape a lot. You have to have a little bit more room to do this shape, but I do think it's very pretty. Okay, so breaking this one down I like this shape because I have um, I have an implied oval right here. So this is my big giant implied oval and this sits horizontally. I have another implied oval right here that also sits horizontally. And I like the fact that this little inside loop right here, so if we make an implied oval and draw it right here, this also sits horizontally and it's halfway below the first descender line and halfway above it. So there's equal space below the first descender line and equal space above the center line. And the same thing with our outside loop coming around right here. Here's our first descender line. And then this one is not quite, this one is a little bit off, but I think it still works. Here is our waistline. 
So there's about this much space that I have dipped below. See how this one is a little bit bigger? I really would have loved it if that was more even. But I still think the overall look of this is completely fine. And this baseline runs about halfway through the middle of this ending flourish right here. So I still like that. So even though I have, I probably needed to dip this down a little bit lower right here in order for this space to be more even with this space, I still think that works completely fine. So that's what I'm talking about. If I miss the mark a little bit, it still looks better to my eye anyway than if I don't try to strive for those things that we're talking about. Okay, let's see. Okay, can you see my paper if I put a flourish right here? Yep. Okay. Okay, our next flourish. So here is our X height. So I've just taken this down and I dipped down sometimes. So here's my first descender. Sometimes I dip down to right here. Sometimes I dip down a little bit lower. Either way is completely fine. However much you dip down below this first descender line, I try to come up about that same amount of space to the first ascender line. So you can tell I've got a little less space right here. Then I do right here. But overall, I still think this looks completely, you know, completely fine. This is one of the uh, flourishes that I do add weight right here. A lot of the times I'll leave my flourishes completely hairlines. I don't know. I just like the way that looks. That's just my personal taste. There's, it, there, there's nothing technically, you know, correct or incorrect about adding weight or not adding weight. Um, I think that's just more of a personal preference. Okay, and then if we take this flourish and then add a little bit to it. Come down. Okay. So breaking this down, I have my first descender line. I have my first ascender line. And I've got about the same amount of space right here as I do right here. It's a little different, but it's pretty close. So I, I'm okay with that. And then when I bring my pen down and dip down below right here, I have dipped down about the same amount of space as I did above. Right there. So this makes this little inside loop right here nice and even. And we have a nice implied oval right here that sits horizontally. And I like to come down and then up and over. And I like to cut this through right in the middle right here. So I've got about the same amount of space on the left side of this line that cuts through as I do on the right side of that line that cuts through. And I think this makes a pretty finish if you can cut that halfway through. And I also like to, and sometimes I, sometimes I, I can do this and sometimes I can't. But I also like to apply my pressure right here in the center. From there to about right there, I want my, my widest shade to be. So when I cross through this little first um, beginning loop right here, when I cross through that at the very end, I like for this to be a hairline. But like I said, sometimes my weight on this uh, stroke is a little bit lower which still works fine. Okay. 
continuing on. Okay, can you see this one right here? Yep. Okay. So on this flourish, add weight. inside loop okay so you really do have to have a lot of room um, for this one but I do think it makes a nice pretty flourish in the end if you do have room for it so breaking this one down we have our first descender line we have our first a center line and this space right here matches this space right here so I like that I think that has made a pretty shape we have an implied oval right here that is running horizontally so that's sitting on its side very nicely so I like that and I have come around and I have dipped down this first ascender line about this much. And then I have come up and over the second ascender line about the same amount of space. That one's a little bit wider, but not much. So now we have another implied oval that sits horizontally right in the center of that line. And then when we come up and over and make this little inside loop right here, this little oval runs right along your slant line. And then this space is parallel all around here. So those are the things that I like about this one. So we've got an oval on its side, an oval that goes with the slant line, and we have a big oval right here, too, that sits on its side. I really do like when the things work out this way, either along the slant line or horizontally. You know, if we had done this inside loop and come down and around right here, and made it like this. And so then when we drew out our little inside oval and it's running this way, and here's our slant line, I still think the overall look of that would be completely fine and I think it would be beautiful. These are just the little bitty teeny tiny tips that I try to tell myself and I do myself to make this look really even and technically correct all the way around like I like for this space to be equal to this space I like for all of the spacing to be even I like for things to cut through the center if at all possible and you know if we had taken this down and around and it ended up being right here that would still be a beautiful flourish even though this space right here would be more narrow than this space right here I just like to aim for the center. So it's not like that if, if you do these things and you don't hit the mark, that it's going to not be a pretty flourish. It still is going to be a beautiful flourish, and it's going to look uh, very nice. These are just the little teeny tiny things, I think, that help really make it look the best that it can look. And if you get a lot of flourishes on your piece that you're working on, whether it's an envelope or a quote or whatever, when you get a lot of those things, flourishes going on like we do right here um, I do think it's very important that uh, that you keep all of these little rules in mind I don't want to mark on this one with pen because I'm going to do this for an Instagram post um, and I'm going to make a copy of this and mark on the copy this is my original so I don't want to mark on it but um, if we were to well let me just do this let me lay this let me take this piece of paper off. 
in the way this just so you know, we're getting a ton of people saying that they are loving this and that they never realized how technical it was. And this is <gasps> blowing their minds. Oh my goodness. Seriously. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Well, I, I tell you, I kind of, um, I didn't even think about flourishing like this either until I started teaching it. And, um, when I started teaching it, then I realized, you know, well, that example that I gave is really bad because I didn't follow what I'm telling other people to do on my example. So I don't really think that I even thought about it that technically until I started teaching it. And, you know, I, I have always said I learn as much or more than my students when I teach something, because the more you say something, the better way that you find the way to say it and the, you know, that the better that you can explain it. So it kind of all happened um, a little bit of, as a fluke, but well, I, um, that we, makes me really excited. Yeah. We're happy we get the benefit of that. <laughs> yes. Yes. So let's break this down just really quickly. And I'm going to write really lightly on here because I'll have to go back and erase my pencil marks. Um, and I am going to post this on Instagram and I'm going to use the red pen for it, but just breaking this down and we'll go from start to finish. Um, and this is what I do usually when I want my flourishes to be absolutely as, as correct as they can possibly be. So I've got, okay, so I started right here with my capital stem. I've got an inside or not an inside, but I've got a, a little loop right here. That sits horizontally. This implied oval right here runs along my slant line. Also, this implied oval right here runs along my slant line. This big gigantic implied oval right here, that sits horizontally, as does this smaller loop right here that sits horizontally, and then this teeny tiny one, it sits horizontally. So we've got slant, slant, horizontal, horizontal, horizontal. All right, then taking this one, this implied oval right here, that sits horizontally. Uh, this one right here, I tried to get this one horizontal. I don't really think I hit the mark that much. But like I said, sometimes it's going to work and sometimes it's not. So the angle of this, this little oval right here is actually kind of running that way. But you know what? It is what it is. I do think the overall look of it still looks fine. And I do like the fact that when I came down and around, that this makes a little implied oval right there that does sit on its side. And then when I finish it off right here, this oval right here is sitting nicely on its side. So really this oval right here is the only one that's sort of out of whack. And I, I think that's okay. So looking at this one on the Y, this implied oval right here is running right along with my slant line. And then this tail coming down here, that is sitting nicely on its side. Okay, and then on my ending flourish, coming down and around right here, here is a large oval that's sitting on its side. Here's my first D cinder line, my first A cinder line. This is the same below, almost as above. I dipped it up a little bit more than I did down here, but again, that's completely fine. And then this little inside loop right here, I don't think it's running quite with my slant line, but it's pretty close to it. It should be. I should have tilted that up a little bit more. And then finishing this off, this implied oval right here is running um, horizontally. And then, can you see this okay if I gotten off? Yep, no, you're good. Okay. So, Obviously, we've got a big, giant implied oval right here that sits nicely on its side. Also, there's the same amount of room below this line as there is above this line. So I like that. That makes it nice and even. Um, 
coming around here, if we were to enclose this in and make that an oval, that would be another nice oval sitting on its side. And I think this shape right here works well because these two ovals balance each other out. So I really like that. Now, this is my next stroke. I'm coming down and up and around. And this little inside loop right here is running along my slant line. And it's sitting nicely right in the center of that. So I like that. Uh, this little oval is right uh, sitting horizontally. And then this implied oval is running fairly close to the slant line. It's off a little bit, but not too bad. And then, of course, we've got a big giant oval down here. If we were to enclose that, that would be running completely horizontally. And then on our ending flourish, I like this because this is very nice and parallel all the way around here. And um, if we were to enclose this oval right here, it would be running along our slant line. And then so is this inside loop right here. That's running fairly close to our slant line. So you can see I've kind of gotten a little off on some of the lines. They're not completely either horizontal or completely parallel to the slant line. But I think if I didn't try to do that and, and I didn't keep all of those little things in mind, this would look completely messy because I would have greatly missed the mark. Whereas here, I've hit the mark on a lot of them and only missed the mark on maybe, you know, two or three or four of them. And, and the ones that I did miss the mark on, it's not by a whole lot. So it's still very close to being either parallel to the slant or completely horizontally. Um, so I do think that it helps me personally. I think it helps a lot breaking it down this way. And what, once I take a piece and kind of critique it and break it down the way I just did, when I go to write the next piece, whether it's the same piece over again or brand new words in another piece, I am so much more aware of how I make my ovals, how I make, you know, how far I dip down for this line. And then, oh, so I've, I've dipped down that amount for this line. So I need to come up that same amount when I come up and over the top. I'm so much more aware of those kinds of things than before I break it down like this. This just helps me really, really be aware of everything. So this is what works for me personally. Okay, so now I'm not sure, um, I'm not sure how long I can talk for or how much time we have or. I or think we're all, uh, we're all loving hearing you talk, Suzanne. So as long, <laughs> as, long as you want to be here, we will be here. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, why don't I do this? Let me, let me see here. We also have um, some people asking in the chat uh, whether or not they can get a copy of those letters you're doing, um, meaning the, the A's you were doing with the flourishes. And I just want to clarify for everyone that um, there's going to be a worksheet provided by Suzanne that we'll talk about at the end of this video where you can go to get it, but she's giving you all a copy of these. So don't worry about needing a picture of it or anything. Yay. Yes. Yes. And if, um, like I said, I'm, I'm rewriting all of my flourishing handouts right now. And the new ones will be much more, um, much more technical like this than what the ones are now. So if I really encourage any of you who are interested in flourishing to take one of my workshops, they're really fun. They're very laid back. We, we sit there really and laugh more than we do anything else. Um, so, but they're, they're just a lot of, of fun and you, you can't help but have fun when you're flourishing anyway. So um, I would be most happy to have anybody that wanted to join me. Um, okay, so let's just maybe talk for just a moment. I don't want to ramble on forever. So let's talk maybe just for a moment on um, descenders. If that's good with you. Yep. And I'll just cover a few ending flourish. Uh, yeah, not ending flourishes. Descender flourishes. Yep. Um, oh, I'm so sorry. 
Yeah, if you want to do maybe um, 10 or so more minutes, and then we'll take a couple questions because we're, we're at about an hour and a half right now. Okay, okay, perfect. Yes. All right. Um, can you see my paper right here? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, this is a flourish that I do a lot. I, I do this a lot, and I see it a lot. So it must be fairly common. I enjoy doing my, my decenters this way, if I have room. And it's all about what you have room for. If you don't have room to do a flourish, don't force the flourish. Just do a very, very simple descending loop, and don't put a flourish on it at all. You still want everything to, be, to look nice and neat and concise. Okay, a couple of things I like about this and a couple of things I don't. Here is my first descender. Here's my second descender line. Um, I really would love for, so this is my first descender line. I really would have loved for this line to cut through this flourish more at the halfway point see how I have this much space below th that first descender line but I've got this much space above it now if I were writing this word and I did this flourish like this and I wasn't you know super happy about it I there is no way I would do it over again I mean it still looks completely fine but if I'm being critical and breaking it down that is one of the things I look for so let's just see if we can make this again a little bit better So if I'm being just super picky, I probably like this one better because my first descender line splits that in the middle a little bit better. And if I have room, which sometimes you don't have room for, I will extend this a little further down and it ends up looking like this. So when I extend it down a little bit further, the one thing that I like the overall look about this is that this ending line right here cuts through about halfway into this oval. And I do like the look of that. So it's, but that will only work out that way if you can extend this lower than that second descender line. If you have to stop it right on the second descender line, when you cross over at the very end, it's going to be a little bit lower than halfway, which is fine. There's no, it's not a big deal. It's just something that I personally notice that I like it when it cuts through at the halfway point. But that's just me and me being OCD. So moving on. So after we've done this simple style right here, we can add to this a little bit. And these uh, have a few little shakes in them, so don't look at these too closely. Um, okay, breaking this down, these are the things that I like about this. I like the fact that this is has parallel spacing all the way around here. So I think that looks good. I also like the fact that this little inside loop is running right along with my slant line. Like it's not cockeyed. It's not going in a funny direction. It's completely parallel with my slant line. And I also like the fact that this ending stroke right here has cut through halfway into that oval right there. Can you see that? Um, and then also I've got this implied oval right here. I'm trying to not get my red pen or touch it to the black ink. This implied oval right here is laying on its side. So I do like that one. So I've got one oval on its side. 
I've got one oval going with the slant line, and then I've got an inside oval going with the slant line, and that inside oval sits directly in the center of that uh, larger oval. Okay, and then you can obviously add on to that if you have room. and come out and put a little bit of weight on it. But this, this right here um, is identical to this first one until you get to, you know, about right here. And instead of just coming up and finishing it out, you're going to just swoop it down and add a little bit of weight. But that's really the only difference in those two. Um, okay, let's see here. Sometimes when I don't have room to have a big long tail like I might have room horizontally but I might not have room vertically to dip this way down I might do something like this I might keep this short and simply just take it out like that and that is a very simple flourish but I like it because it's even for starters, like when we go around here and make this implied oval, it's sitting on its side. And if I were to continue on with this one, it would be sitting on its side also. So I feel like that's nice and, and balanced. Um, and again, so I didn't dip this down as far as I did this one. I kept it a little bit short. Um, so again, if, if you have room horizontally, you can add on to this as well. So let me scoot my paper over here. Okay, can you see this right here? Can, yeah. you, see, can you see my hand? Okay, all right, perfect. So if we're going to add on to this. Um, okay, so there are some things I like about this and some things I don't. I do like the fact that this makes a nice horizontal oval. So I like that. I think, I, I wish I would have dipped down a little bit further right here because here is my first descender line. And I've got this much space. And then here is my, oh, I'm sorry. That's my second descender line. Here is my first descender line. And see how this space is, is wider? That sort of bugs me. But I, I probably, again, I would not redo that flourish at all. That's just something that I'm looking for when I'm critiquing this and really getting technical and breaking it down. Um, so I kind of wish I had dipped down a little bit further right there, but again, it's no big deal. I do normally add weight when I come down around right there, but that's just a personal preference. I don't always add weight right there, but you absolutely can. Um, I do like to cut back up through the center of this implied oval right here. So this oval is sitting nicely on its side. And this ending stroke right here comes right through the middle of that. So now I've got the same amount on the left side as I do on the right side. I've got so many marks now, you probably can't even see that. But this finishing stroke right here, I like for it to cut halfway through the center of that oval. And I think, you know, all of those little bitty things help keep that nice and neat and, and balanced looking. Um, let's see here. Suzanne, would you be okay if we start um, taking some questions? And maybe, I think some of them will require some demonstration anyway. Yeah. So the... yeah, absolutely. Okay. 
So if anybody in the chat has any questions they want Suzanne to demonstrate specifically, um, I'm just scrolling through here to see. Okay. Um, lots of people just saying they really loved it. <laughs> oh, good. Um, well, I hope it's helpful. It, it's helpful to me, but, you know, everybody doesn't think it like I do and think the same way. It, but it, it does help me personally. So hopefully it can help a few other people, too. I think it's just so valuable to see that you actually go through with a red a red pen and correct your practice too, because I mean, oh, you, yes. you can think of it as an oval, but until you go over and trace it and draw it in an oval. That's right. Hard to actually That's see. right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I think on my work anyway, um, you know, I'll look at a piece and I'll think, well, yeah, that looks, that looks pretty okay. But then just like something's not quite, write about it and it just kind of might be bugging me and I can't really put my finger on it if I go back and absolutely you know critique it to death and break it down with a red pen or a pencil or whatever I usually can find what's wrong with it and you know then all of a sudden I'm like oh well no wonder because this oval is completely cattywampus compared to the one right beside it so you know that makes it even stick out more yeah. as being, you know, off. And so I, you, I, I can usually find why I don't like something if I break it down that way. Yep. Definitely. Okay. Um, someone is asking if you ever advise doing flourished connector strokes. Flourished connector strokes. I, I'm not 100% sure what you mean by a, a flourished connector stroke. Um. Uh... Yeah, I'm trying to picture what that would be, too. Um, yeah. if I can't see the person's name who wrote that, but if, if you're the person who wrote that, just let us know, again, what you, and clarify a little bit. Um, some other questions. The angled lines on your sheet, how far apart are those? Do you remember? Uh, this is something I just printed off of the, the Iampeth website, and it looks like, let me just measure here. Looks like they're close to, they're about three-fourths of an inch apart. Yeah. So I'll just I'll, okay. I'll send people so to, to the IAMPTH website anyway. That would be yeah, helpful. yeah. And um, they they have um, five millimeters, six millimeters. Um, I also know that Nina Tran has several kinds of guidelines on her website. Yeah. And I, I I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. I think also Logos Calligraphy. That's Young Hay Chung, who she and Nina are both fabulous calligraphers. I think Young Hay also has guidelines on her website as well. Yeah, I think she does too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm just writing their um, Instagram names here so everybody can find them. Yes. And Nina's, uh, Nina's um, username on Instagram is Anan, which is Nina backwards, Anan Tran. Yeah. And then uh, Young Hayes is logos underscore calligraphy. Oh, I just wrote it without the underscore here. Okay, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they're they're both two of my favorites. They're phenomenal and sweet people to boot. So that's a that's a bonus. Um some other questions here. Do you have guidance on the size of the ovals relative to the size of the text for the flourishes? Uh <laughs> Not really that I just follow completely. Like I knew on this piece, can you see this? Yep. I knew on this one I wanted big giant flourishes. Um, if I were writing on an envelope, there, you know, that's going to get messy looking. So I know I can't have those big humongous flourishes on an envelope. I've got to keep them a little more simple. I've got to keep them smaller. I, I think the main thing is that what I like to look for in a whole piece is if I know I've got this big oval coming off on the left with, you know, a few little doodads coming off of it. But the, but the main movement and shape is a big giant oval over here. Then I want to kind of mirror that over here on the right side. So I don't want to have all of this, this vastness going on over here on the left and then once I get to the U down here do like a little bitty tiny flourish like that would not look good at all you want this to kind of balance and mirror what you've got going on over here and then I like this uh coming up higher because 
this little flourish right here is in the center of these two flourishes. So we kind of have a little bit of a left, a right, and a middle. And I like the fact that this comes up a little bit higher. And then we've got these three, meaning one, two, three. Like when, when I visually look at that, I see one, two, three down here on the bottom. This kind of um, holds this in right here. I like the way that makes a little bit of a U shape. Uh, so I, I don't know. I just think this looks pleasing to the eye. It looks balanced, even though I don't have, I've got like one, two, three on the bottom. I don't have right here, one, two, three, like I do down here, but I've got a larger one, two, three. So I still think this all works. So I've got kind of a little umbrella on the top, and then I've got the reverse of that on the bottom. So really, if you were to take this whole entire shape, you could really draw a big giant oval all the way around it. And that oval would, for the most part, be sitting horizontally. So I think the overall look of that works, even though I've got a lot of stuff going on, you know, within the piece. But <clears throat> again, like if it, I think the size of your ovals really does depend on what you're working on. If I'm working on an envelope, there's no way that I can do all this on an envelope. Unless maybe it's like the, the inside envelope where I've got more room. I think one of the main things, though, is that if you've got a big giant flourish on one side, you balance it out with sort of that same feel on the other side. Like I wouldn't do large big ovals on the left and then do lots of little bitty ovals on the right. I want both sides to have the same kind of feel to them, if that makes sense. Yep, totally. And a lot of times too on these larger flourishes as within this piece, I like to keep those all hairlines. And again, that's just my completely personal preference. That's just what I like to do. Oh, I wanted to tell you one of the one of the flourishers that I look up to the most, and she does these kinds of flourishes that are very large and a lot of hairlines is Nicoletta. And I think it's Nicoletta underscore school, maybe. Nicoletta school. I'm not a hundred percent sure on that. So don't quote me on that. But if you type in Nicoletta, it should pop right up. But her flourishing is absolutely amazing. And um, she does a lot of hairline flourishes. There's not a lot of weight to her flourishes. They're all just very wispy and light. And I just really love the way that looks. So she's a, a great source of inspiration for me when I uh, when I think about my flourishing. How do you spell Nicoletta? It's, uh, let's see. I think it's N I. K-O-L-I-E-T-T-A. -E oh. And I think it's underscore. It's underscore calligraphy. I found that. Calligraphy. Okay, perfect. Yes, yeah, she is amazing. She is amazing. And I think she is in Russia somewhere, but I could be wrong about that. But she is like, wonderful. Yeah. It looks like Moscow, Russia. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She is wonderful. So we got um, some clarification on what the connector, the flourish connectors meant. I think what the person was asking was um, sort of letters that are in the middle of a word as opposed to on the start or the end. Okay, gotcha. So if uh, how I would want to flourish a letter that's in the middle. Yeah. So what, um, do you have any sort of guidelines for that? Yes. Usually, um, let me move this out here. Let me think of a word that has no descenders. So if I'm going to write the word um, sweet, I'm just going to do this with a pencil because it's quick and easy. So there's the word sweet. It has no descenders. Really, it has no ascenders except for the T. So we could make this a nice big flourish for that crossbar but what I would probably do is I would probably drop 
one of these E's and maybe take it down and around and maybe just finish this off right here and just kind of keep it simple. Let's see if I can write that with the pointed pen and make it look pretty. Can you see my hand here? And I might put just a little loop right there. So I think that works okay. I could have also taken it off the T and it just been on the end and dipped this down and then come down and around like that. But usually I would just pick a letter uh, that's in the middle of the word or somewhere close to the middle of the word that has an underturn. And underturns are really easy to just dip down and continue that on and still keep the, the main shape of the letter. Like you can always, if we've got an L in the middle of a word, you can always dip that maybe just down and around and keep it like that. That's an easy flourish to do. So it would just be kind of maintaining that balance and making sure you're still following the rules with the ovals and that kind of yes. thing. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. So just take, for instance, and I didn't really think about this one as I was making it, but I do like the way it turned out because I've got an oval right here that's sitting fairly nicely right on its side. And I have dipped down about the same amount of space that I have come up and over that line. So this little oval right here, I've got this space that's running right through the middle of it. And I like the way that looks. But now, you know, once we have made our piece and um, we don't have these guidelines anymore on here, and it looks like this, Nobody knows how far you've dipped down and how far you've come up. And nobody's going to know that you've got, you know, say, not quite as much space right here as you do right here. That's only if you've got the guidelines back behind it. So don't, don't be too hard on yourself if you're practicing this and you think you have come down a little bit too low on this one portion because it's not quite even with the portion that's up above it. It doesn't matter because once you remove those guidelines, then you don't see those. You don't see it at all. But if you're aware of those things as you're writing and you do try to make it even, uh, I, I just think it makes the overall shape prettier and more appealing to the eye. And I think it's one of those things that once you do remove the guidelines, if you haven't thought about that while you're doing it, it just won't look quite as appealing to the eye overall and I feel like it's going to be one of those things that you just can't quite put your finger on you know it doesn't look as good as you want it to but you're not sure why but if you do follow these little rules that we've just gone over I, I really do think it just makes the whole look of it much prettier overall I know it does with me anyway yeah sure Okay, um, we have I have one more question that I think okay. will require um, demonstration and it's uh -huh. one that was submitted ahead of time. Uh -huh. So Kendra asked, how do you write the next line on an envelope and cross over the line above it without making a mess? Yes, yes. Um, I wish I had one of my envelopes here right in front of me and I would show you. Um, let me see if I've got one right here. No, that one doesn't have one. Okay. What I normally do is, can you see, see me if I'm writing right here? Yep. You might want to move it, move it up a tiny little bit. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So say if I'm writing the word, um, let's just write the word pretty.
See how slowly I go. Yes, I love it. Okay. So let's say that here is my next baseline. And I've got to write the word um, have or something that's got an H or an L. And it ends. And I need to start my next letter right about there. And so then you sound like, oh, shoot, that's going to bump into that. What do I do? I would just take it. Say if this is an L, I would take it up. And this one is really crossing over. Usually I can kind of finagle it a little bit where it doesn't cross over quite that much. So if we're writing the word love. Everyone always wants to write the word love and it's one of the hardest words I, I find. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I also write the word hello. If I'm ever testing ink to see if I've got the right consistency or whatever, I always just write hello. And then I've got, you know, I've got three ascenders and it never looks good. I'm like, yeah. I could pick an easier word. But what I do, I just normally tuck one of those behind the other one. And I also sort of do the same thing. I'll write this real quickly. When I write the word Mr. and Mrs. So this is how I would normally do it. This is my go-to M. And this is not my best work because I'm writing a little bit quicker. So there's Mr. So I'm getting ready to write my next M. And I want to do the M fairly similar to this one. But I feel like if I start way over here and do this flourish, that this M is just kind of off in la-la land and not really part of this little grouping. So I like for that to be tucked in there a little bit closer. So I will usually just start my next M a little closer and stop right there. and tuck it in behind there. So you still sort of like ghost the motion of the rest of that line. Yes, uh -huh. I stop here. Sometimes I'll start back up right there and cross over this line, but sometimes not. So I stop right there, pick up, and then just sit it right back down and keep on going. But that kind of tucks that in there behind it a little bit, and it doesn't look like, Mr. Uh, Mr. And are way over here to the left, and then Mrs. is way over here to the right. I usually do that pretty much every time for my Mr. and Mrs. But yeah, on the um, when ascenders and descenders clash, um, oops, I'm sorry, when they clash, I will just tuck the one below it in behind the one above it. And usually too, like if I'm writing this word and I know I've got words down below here that I've got to fit in there, I won't take, so here is our first descender line. There's our second descender line. I won't take this loop all the way down to the second descender line. I'll stop it about right there. I'll go about halfway. So if this is our X height, can you see my pen right here? Yeah. I would stop it short like that right there. So there's our first descender line. There's our second descender line. So I don't take it all the way down. I take it about halfway into that space. And that gives me a little bit more room to work with in case I have an ascender on that next line. And same thing, I may not take my ascender up all the way if I don't have room for it. I just kind of wing it and do whatever is appropriate for the moment in that situation. But generally, I do leave my descender short like this when I'm working on envelopes because I know I've got two or three more lines below what I'm working on and I've got to make room for it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. All right. I think we got to stop taking questions because we're, <laughs> we're almost at two hours here. <laughs> um, oh, my goodness. 
So yeah, I think it's I think it's safe to take the camera off your hands now. You can put it back. Okay, perfect. Let me turn this bad boy around. <laughs> Yay, I'm back. So that was awesome. That was really, really good. We got a, a lot of comments of people saying that that, that was really helpful. I think uh, we have almost enough question to like merit another interview someday. <laughs> yes, yes, I would love to. I would love to. That that was really fun. I hope I didn't just ramble on and on about nothing and confuse you even more than no. Than no, I think, I did. I think but, it was um, very yeah, helpful. It does help me to break it down. Um, Definitely, definitely. And I feel like I'm more aware of how I make the shapes after I have broken it down. And so then it just helps me overall. And even if I, I don't hit it exactly, I'm way closer than if I don't think about it. For sure. So, yeah. So, um, okay. So I'll just mention, I'm going to pop up on the screen here, the link for anybody who wants to grab those guide sheets that you are providing so nicely for us. Um, so it's the happyevercrafter.com slash Suzanne dash Cunningham. So all of the worksheets that Suzanne is providing for you guys, which are awesome, are available there. And you can just put your email address and I'll send them over to you. Um, and when I and get my new guidelines written, maybe we can come back and talk some more and they can get some samples from my, my, my new guide sheets. Yes. Because those are going to look amazing. I have a graphic designer helping me because I can't do any of it myself. <laughs> That's okay. The content on them is, is amazing on its own too. Well, thank you. Thank you. So, um, what, is there anything like up and coming in Suzanne Cunningham worlds that you want anyone to know about or, uh, you know, if anybody wanted to maybe comment and tell me what they would like to learn, whether it's beginning copper plate or flourishing or how to address envelopes, um, modern script, um, I am going to be doing a workshop. These You can't register for these yet, probably sometime this summer, and I will post on Instagram. But October 27th and 28th, I'm going to be at 1818 Farms doing a flourishing class for one day. And then the next day, we'll be doing either a half day of envelope addressing or a full day. I haven't written my notes on that yet, and I've never taught that class, so I don't know how long it's going to be yet. I keep thinking in my mind, eight hours is a long time to talk about addressing an envelope. But, but look, I have a feeling did, I could probably talk that long about it, though. So I We may just start did two out hours with, here without even trying. So I, I know, I know. So I, I may start out with four hours, and then it probably will quickly grow to eight hours. Um, but anyway, that's October 27th to 28th at 1818 Farms. And then I'm going to be doing that, that exact same thing flourishing and envelope addressing the very next weekend at paper and ink arts in Nashville. And I think that's November 3rd and 4th. And I would also love to sneak in another workshop, maybe in September sometime here in Florence, there is um, an event space that's going to be really cool that I can use and it will probably be open in July sometime. So it's not yet available uh, for me to use, but it will be, um, sometime this summer. So if there's enough interest, I would love to, um, to add another one in September. Well, you're getting a lot of comments here of people that want you to do an online course because they can't go to any of those places. <laughs> but you and I talked I off the air about how you're technologically challenged a little bit. So. It's, it's awful. But, you know, sadly, I still don't have an excuse because um, my brother is a TV and film um director. <laughs> and so, uh, he makes commercials. He does radio. Uh, he does all of that. So I don't even have an excuse. And we have talked several times before about how, okay, we, we're going to make an online class. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And I think just because the fact that he's my brother and I'm his sister, it's just, it, it doesn't get done because it's not official. You know what I'm saying? It's just, oh, it's my brother. You know, and he's like, oh, well, that's my sister. I, yeah, we'll get around to that. So I don't well, know. I can tell you that push to the back burner, but there's one day, I do feel like it's going to happen. There's definitely interest. People are people are commenting up a storm right now. Oh, thank, <laughs> you. thank you. Well, it would be fun. It would be fun. I would love to do it. It's just so, a matter of, you know, making the time to do it and actually doing it. So what's the best place for people to find you? Are you most active on Instagram? Um, Instagram is S U Z Cunningham. Um, my, I, I don't have a website. 
I told you I'm, I'm very archaic when it comes to technology, but I feel like I have lasted for 25 years now without a website. So why do I want one? Um, and there again, my brother said he would build me one. And that's probably why, you know, we haven't done it yet, just because it's my brother. So, which is all good. But um, so I don't have a website. So I'm sorry about that. But um, my email, if you ever need to email me at, for any reason, is suz822cunningham at gmail.com. So that's my email. No website, unfortunately. Maybe one day. And um, then Instagram is S-U-Z Cunningham. Amazing. So thank you again. That was really awesome. Super. Uh, thank super you. Thank you for having that. me. It's been fun. Yeah. And uh, I'll just pop this link up on the page one more time for anybody who needs to grab those worksheets. And this will be available for replay too. So people can come back and actually practice what you awesome. were teaching. Awesome. Uh, and uh, yeah, I guess we will sign off for now, but we'll have to plan another one at some yes, point. Yes, definitely. Definitely. <laughs> I'm here anytime you just say the word. That'll be fun. Okay. Thanks a lot, Suzanne. Thank you, Becca. Yeah. I appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.